It's My Life Season 3, featuring a panel discussion on textile chemicals and a circular world. Explore how textile chemicals can contribute to a circular economy with our expert panelists. Carlo Centonze, Jernak Mehta, Michael Rauch, and Mohamed Foz Ul Azim. Moderated by Siva Pariti Kumar. Welcome to Itma Live. We have an interesting panel to discuss about textile chemicals and how it can contribute to a circular world. Chemicals and colorants play an important role in apparel and footwear production. Today, we will invite our panel to address some of the topics such as key barriers to achieving chemical circularity, best practices on chemical management, chemical compliance and renewable uh, raw material sources, etc. So let me introduce the panel uh, which we have. I have Mr. Carlo, from the, who is the CEO from the HiQ. Mr. Carlo. Thank you very much. Thanks for introducing me. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm one of the two founders of uh, HiQ 18 years ago. Actually, my first uh, startup company was uh, My Climate, which is uh, an organization, an NGO, which is active in climate protection and carbon trading, one of the market leaders today with the success companies out of it. And I'm, uh, I'm acting group CEO for Haiku, which is a listed, non-listed company. I'm also chairman of the family company, which is 109 years old in uh, chemical trading. So we know chemistry for a long, long time in our family. Uh, and uh, I'm also on the board of Science Industry, which is the Association of Swiss Pharma, Chemicals and Biotech Industries. Very nice to be here with you. Thank you, Mr. Carlo. Mr. I have Mr. Pro Professor Dr. Michael Raj, uh, who is also representing the Hof University of Applied Sciences and the treasurer of IF IFATCC, uh, Professor Raj. Yeah, thank you for your short introduction, Mr. Siva. So I'm also the head of a master program, Sustainable Textiles, and uh, I'm the president of the German Association of Textile Specialists. And I'm looking forward to for this panel discussion today. Thank you. Mr. Janak Mehta, who is the president of Dyes and Pigments Manufacturers Association of India, DMAI, and also the Chairman of Asia Dystrophic Feder Industry Federation (ADIF). Hi, this is Janak Mehta. I am the president of the Dyes and Pigments Manufacturers Association of India. I am also the chairman of the Asia Dystrophic Industry Federation. The ADIF, as it's generally called, is made up of associations from all over Asia, and this is a new body which we have formed in 2018. And I've been fortunate enough to be selected as the first chairman of this body. Mr. Mohammad Pauzul Azim, who is general manager of corporate sustainability and chemical management at Indadloop, Pakistan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Seva, uh, for a brief introduction. I'm uh, Mohammad Fawzul Azim and uh, heading uh, corporate sustainability and chemical management function in Indadloop. Interloop uh, is uh, a multi-category textile manufacturing company uh, based in Pakistan. And uh, uh, we, we are uh, just uh, one of the uh, world's largest hosiery manufacturers as well. So right now we are just uh, dealing with a multi-category uh, hosiery, denim, apparel, activewear. Uh, so um, I am uh, by qualification uh, uh, master's in chemistry. And uh, I have experience of about 22 years in uh, textile as well as research and development organizations across my career. So let me take uh, you through the questions and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Carlo, what are the key barriers which we think are currently needs to be addressed to achieve the chemical circularity in the textile industry or footwear industry as well? So we we have uh, if we want two main uh, chemical sources in uh, in in textile uh, we have the dye stuffs and the finishes which uh, by weight of mass are a very small part and then we have the 
oil-based fibers, which by mass are making 70% of the total volume of textiles. So circularity, if you look at it holistically for, for both aspects, uh, is, is very crucial, but is uh, prevented by the very high usage of uh, oil-based synthetic fibers, which will always, from a chemical point of view, both the big uh, problem to establish full circularity. We have seen that our recycled polyester, recycled nylon are uh, hard to uh, recycle in terms of uh, reducing the environmental footprint. They can be recycled, uh, especially polyester. Nylon is very tough, but uh, the polyester is the main part of the market. And there's a recycling that is possible, but at a cost, at a cost of an environmental footprint, because you are reprocessing, you are regathering logistically, and ultimately there's a degradation of the quality of the follow-up fiber. So closed loop recycling is really what we what we ought to be talking about. Can we take a textile and make a textile at the same performance again? Uh, that is very, very difficult. And we don't have many substitution technologies ready, which are not oil-based today. So we in science slash industry are running, but we're lagging a bit behind. And that is one of the uh, uh, key issues that our industry faces, that we're being highlighted as the main polluter, uh, which we are. So we're the second most polluting industry uh, in the world. And we're running for alternatives. And it's uh, a really demanding challenge to our industry to move into circularity. If I move on to the dye stuffs and uh, finishes, they are an essential part to make a textile sellable, if you want, and, and wearable. Uh, if we don't use chemistry in textiles, that's also something very important. Uh, there is no textiles, so not as we are used to. So chemicals are an intrinsic part of the processes to manufacture and to give function or comfort or performances that we are used to and don't want to get unused to. So this is um, where a big challenge is two we're a small part of the total uh, we're very hard to um, be by itself uh, circular or re recycled we're always attached to the fiber so if we talk about circularity of dye stuffs and chemicals then in my opinion it's always in conjunction with the recycling of the full textile fiber uh, component and uh, this is where we should uh, in future put our um, uh, our focus as a dye stuff slash chemical finishing industry, we need to not prevent recyclability with the compounds that we bring into textiles. We need to not prevent biodegradability. So our focus has to be not to be circular itself with the dye stuff, with the finish, but to enable or allow uh, circularity. And the focus of the industry also from us should be to work towards a greener, uh, biodegradable uh, carbon neutral fiber that can replace polyester, which is, in my opinion, the main issue that our industry is facing today. Thank you. Professor Raj? Yeah, from my point of view, uh, I, most important for me is um, education and knowledge. So we need well educated textile engineers, textile designers, textile chemists. They have a focus on uh, circularity. So I think very important is to train the students that they, when they are design new products to think about how to recycle it, if they use uh, fiber blends or not, and how to support the recycling. And I agree with Mr. Carlo, so we have to enable with textile chemistry the recycling of uh, these uh, fibers. But also on the other hand, in my opinion, very important is the, I think we have a very good recycling of textile production waste in Europe, uh, but we also need a, a collection of end consumer textile waste in Europe. So uh, also the retailer have to find a way to collect all the textile 
waste from the concept on the end consumer and then we have to put this end consumer waste also in the recycling uh, circle. Thank you. From the user perspective, Mr. Faust. Thank you. Um, I, I, I um, of course, there are a lot many points already discussed. Uh, so I, I agree with all, all those inputs. Uh, from my side, I would just want to add that uh, when we are talking about the chemical circularity uh, from a um, uh, consumer or manufacturer perspective, uh, I think the most important is that we need to uh, reconsider or we need to focus our, uh, our mindset as well. Because when you are talking about mindset, the, the way we are uh, handling the chemicals, the way we are using the chemicals, we need to transform uh, that totally. Because, uh, of course, currently we have a lot many challenges when we are using the chemicals. Of course, we are wasting a lot of chemicals into the ETP to treat them finally. So we need to change uh, uh, our way of thinking that we need to reduce the use of the chemicals first. So the minimum chemical we can use, we must design our operations processes uh, to use the chemicals as minimum as possible. The second point is that, of course, we need to work on the technologies in which we can reuse or uh, recycle the chemicals as well. So chemicals, stream-wise separation of the chemical that we are using in our recipes that need to be uh, addressed because right now we are just mixing all the chemicals into the ETP and then we are trying to treat those chemicals to just comply the environmental standards. But maybe we need to reconsider the way we are handling the chemicals and for that I, I totally agree that uh, a very robust uh, innovation um, mindsets and of course we need to focus on the new technologies uh, because there are a lot many technologies who are replacing the chemicals right now. So the technologies like uh, the laser in the denim or the ozone in the denim. So they are, they are just transforming the way we are producing impacts on the textiles. Let me talk about the second point, which is important, that uh, when it comes to the circularity and recyclability or reusability, uh, we have to also look at the toxic chemicals present in the uh, in the article. So, what uh, what is critical as a textile manufacturer to have? How important is to eliminate the use of toxic chemicals from the production processes? So that if that is happening, how do we scale the best practices to phase out these chemicals uh, of high concern from this sector? Uh, I will start with the user uh, first. So, Mr. Faust. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, when we are talking about the toxicity of the chemicals, the first thing is that we we need to understand this toxicity because again, the the um, the standard of toxicity is something uh, different for the different uh, people. So first of all, we need to agree on the standard uh, toxicity definitions, and maybe we need to agree globally on that. Uh, for the manufacturing perspective, uh, of course, switching chemical or phasing out chemical is one of the biggest challenges right now because our whole operation on, is based on set recipes and set chemicals we are using. So when we are just switching one chemistry uh, to the other chemistry, it's not the matter of a simple switching overnight. We need to uh, have a very detailed analysis, maybe in terms of quality of the final product, maybe the, uh, the processes, maybe the, uh, the whole uh, process mapping that we are doing in recipe uh, management system. So the, the important thing is that uh, we need to understand before time, but what are the key uh, components in our chemistry, in our uh, whole uh, chemical inventory, that need to be replaced or phased out in a certain period of time. So until unless we don't have the visibility that what is going to happen maybe in the next one or two years, of course, we cannot phase out most of the toxic chemicals uh, from our inventory. Uh, it's, it's a matter of a long journey to switch from one chemical to other chemical. Mr. Carlo? Yes, I think very fair points here that have been brought forward from uh, from our our colleagues. Um, I think one of the main uh, difficulties that we face in our industry is also cost. Textile is an industry mm -hmm. where the dime matters. So cost is extremely important to be able to sell on the market. Uh, this has a um, 
a crucial um, reason that the cost is today dictated by brand and retail that is selling to to the consumer and uh, there is a big squeeze in the in the value chain where we don't have much room to maneuver do greener safer chemistries exist yes they do exist today do they exist at the same cost point than the petrochemical ones no they don't because they're not manufactured at scale which would give them the benefits of the economies of scale to match the petrochemical uh, cost points. So it is at the end an industry effort which should also start from the brands. The brands and the retailers, if they want to sell greener, safer, better products, must also agree to use at the moment more expensive chemical solutions that do exist which would then create more demand for these greener solutions, which would, by having more demand, uh, make the economies of scale play, which would bring the costs down and ultimately drive what we have to do as an industry, substitute the hydrocarbon-based, oil-based source for most of the chemicals, because we know about the consequences these compounds have in, in our environment. Here said, uh, it's, it's a joint responsibility. It's not that we can point fingers to the brand and retail only. There is alternatives in terms of, uh, of technologies available that also at a middle level we can start looking into with reasonable cost differences, with differentiation potential to sell through and educate the brands and educate the entire value chain. Here also education playing an important role. So I think it is... Um, it is a game that we have to play uh, together, chemical industry, textile mills, brands, retail, uh, where, we, uh, where we agree that uh, uh, we must uh, switch away. And then uh, uh, we also agree that there will be a, a price increase that consumers will have to foot for a greener, better, safer product in the beginning, uh, not long term, but in the beginning. And that's a difficult, that's a very difficult proposal to the market. Fully agree. Now, let's look at uh, the other aspect of the emerging technologies, let us say. The, these days, what is a new buzzword, wherever you look at, is renewable or bio-based or plant-based raw materials. So, what is uh, this? They are getting uh, important uh, day by day and they are getting made into the fibers, into materials, into chemicals and colorants these days as well. So, what is it? Is it the best way for the way forward for the textile industry to be more uh, sustainable and uh, the circular uh, going forward? Yeah, um, yeah. You touch uh, touch one of the core points where where, where our company is uh, is is innovating uh, for for really bringing drive into uh, into substitution uh, of. Uh, of man-made oil-based fibers. As I mentioned before, I think our biggest problem that we have is that 70% of all textiles worldwide are plastic. Okay, we, if we're lucky, we can wear cotton, but we also know that there's a limit for growth of cotton. We see it now with the Ukraine crisis. We need in future to feed more people and we need more land for food and not for growing clothes. So it's tough, it's a competition for a resource that is getting scarcer with, with climate warming. So we will have less agricultural land available. Um, so what can we do? Um, we Our approach five years ago has been, we must replace the polyester-based, nylon-based, polypropylene-based fibers. And we have started looking at, uh, at cellulose. And uh, cellulose is, is the most abundant biopolymer that we have available in the world. There is man-made cellulosic fibers that have been uh, produced, but they never managed to go above six, seven percent of market share. So when we looked at why, uh, the reason is that the processes that have been designed to manufacture these fibers didn't allow uh, a low environmental footprint, didn't allow a high quality that can compete with a let's put it blank polyester is a great fiber it's very performing uh, it's cheap uh, and it's readily available uh, around the globe so the competition has been very hard and 
the price point has also been very hard. So I think one of the key solutions which HiQ is trying to inform is, can we make a, a man-made cellulosic fibers at high performance and low cost to substitute polyester? And if we are successful with that, then 50% of the problem we're talking about <laughs> on, on sustainability and circularity in our industry is solved. So we have a very big lever that we can pull if we put our brains to, to solve one, uh, one problem. So I think with this science of using biopolymers, picking up more weight in our industry, many other chemistries will uh, follow and, and adopt it as a, uh, as a working basis. So the hydrocarbon is just a very comfortable and very cheap and readily available basis. Hence, there is uh, a reticence to change. And uh, I think we need to uh, push change very hard. The regulator might help by putting penalties on plastic textiles going forward. Um, but I think as an industry, we need to rethink substantially on uh, on the approach of how can we bring green technologies to scale fast so that they can produce cheap and we can uh, switch. Thank you. Mr. Janak? Bio-based fuels and bio-based raw materials are important. You already have in India ethylene from glasses being mixed with petrol and ethylene going into making ethylene glycol. But then if you are to see if bio-based fuels and raw materials are to replace the hydrocarbons, how much land will it require to grow? What about the food security? We already have a problem with the Ukraine war and with the increasing population of the planet, that is a major concern. Also, if we try to grow plants which will give us bio raw materials and bio based fuels, are we going to affect the biodiversity of a place? Earlier, also, we had some suggestion that we would like to have universal standards or uh, or uh, material uh, based on the safety aspects. But sometimes safety aspects are not the same. You know, the hazard in a particular place, the climatic conditions, the DNA of a person depends, uh, differentiates, uh, it is different from that of another place where you have a very different climatic condition and the same standard does not work. You have a different hazard analysis and assessment. So likewise, the biodiversity of a place will be adversely affected. So in our, in our in our efforts to try and have a safer and circular economy in the textile industry, we should not we should be careful that we don't end up with a bigger problem in trying to find a solution to the current problem. So I, I come to Faust first and then go back there to him. Yeah, Mr. Faust. Okay, uh, I think when you are talking about the uh, sustainable materials or the bio-based materials or the bio-based chemicals finishes, I think uh, the sustainability is the most complex topic to, to define it. Uh, of course, we, we are talking nowadays about uh, the bio-based chemicals or the bio-based uh, raw materials, but still, I think um, maybe when we are talking about the bio-based, so our top uh, thing in my, our mind is the biodegradability. But I think in the whole, whole canvas of sustainability, biodegradability is not the only factor we need to consider. We have a lot many other elements in sustainability. We need to consider the energy consumptions. We need to consider the water consumptions. We need to consider maybe the land use or land abuse. We need to consider maybe the emissions as well. So uh, when we are talking about the sustainability in, in perspective of biomaterials or the biochemicals, maybe that's a complex thing. So maybe if we are talking about um, uh, the uh, bio-based dyes, the natural dyes, of course, they, they have, a, it, this seems very good, but maybe because we don't have the data behind that, that how much land is required to handle the whole textile sector globally if we are switching from the synthetic dyes to the natural dyes. Maybe we don't have the data that how much water consumption or resource consumption if we are just thinking about the bio-based dyes or the chemicals or the starches 
or the enzymes we are just talking right now. So uh, at one L, at one end, when we are talking about the degradation, that's that's good. But still, we need to consider the other components as well. So this is my one point that maybe uh, every bio-based inputs they they could be sustainable or they could not be sustainable if we compare it with the uh, synthetics until and unless we don't have the whole supply chain data for that. So uh, keeping in view both things that either the bio-based things are sustainable or not that they must be based on some whole supply chain database. Otherwise, maybe we, we, we might confuse ourselves in, in a bigger framework when we are calculating the whole uh, material inputs or the chemical inputs. And then we integrate them together and then we calculate that, okay, if the resource consumptions are good, or bad, and what what is up and what is down. So th this this need to be addressed first when we are considering bio inputs in our supply chain. Uh, Professor Michael, you are having uh, to add up to this point from Paus. Yes, it's possible. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Azam. So I think it's very important to see all three pillars of sustainability. And uh, you point out natural dye stars from plant. I think it's a very important field. But here we have to look. Uh, we get not in competition to the food production. We made some research work in the past to get dye stars out of plants. They are not used for food production. This is also possible. And we have to find for different countries, different areas, specific plants we can create uh, or we, let, we can produce natural dye stuff out of it. So, but this is not globally, uh, no globally supply, it's much more local supply to get local plants to, to produce natural dye stuff. Yeah, so to come to uh, the last point uh, of our discussion, because these are, all very important topics which we are talking about. How can textile chemists, machinery people, or technology providers can actually accelerate the evolution of circular future? I will start with uh, Professor uh, your point because you are the creator of this entire uh, future generation. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, in my opinion, very important is we improve our data transfer between different steps of textile production. We have now, we have so many uh, IT tools to, to uh, collect all the data to, to get uh, results out of the data. So, I think very important is to have for each uh, textile uh, finishing plant database about the used chemical, about the water, the electrical consumption, the, the effluent amount, and so on. And I think uh, also in comparison with the machine manufacturer, if you have more data available, also more data from uh, textile auxiliaries and textile dye stuff, those uh, uh, producers. So here we can optimize or improve our. Uh, textile production. Here we have we have some master thesis running uh, with uh, to get data out of uh, uh, textile production to see what you put in uh, the, the textile production process and what is coming out. And then we we would like to make a, a pre calculation. Maybe we get the, we can calculate the effluent parameter like CUD, BUD and something else from the available data of the material safety sheets and of the consumption of water and energy. So it's running. I think now also some uh, tools available like, like barcode reader for, for, for textile products. I think if you have a label on each, uh, each container for textile auxiliaries and we can easily uh, get all the data out. So I think this, is, this will help to optimize the textile production. So you are talking about digital passport or digitalization or that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Janak? The circular future will require not only the machinery maker, the textile chemist, but will require all stakeholders. As uh, Professor Rauch said earlier, 
it will have to start with the students we'll have to sensitize them we'll have to also sensitize all stakeholders towards circular economy and uh, the, the 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 efforts joint efforts of the textile manufacturers manufacturers the machinery manufacturers and the chemists will all come into play if we have a platform like itma where all come together and discuss the problems and then carry on i'm sure uh, proper brainstorming session can uh, bring and speed up uh, proper results in a shorter time than it would otherwise take and and mr carlos your view yeah i think uh, um, data sharing is, uh, is 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 a key is a key aspect of uh, of building a circular uh, future uh, i i think also uh, faus mentioned before that it is it is very important to uh, uh, to integrate if you want the entire value chains and there's many aspects to what is sustainability and it's it's not a one it's it's a holistic view on which we also we also kind of need to agree before we say this is the circular uh, uh, future so it's which parameters which baselines which data uh, are we using to inform um, to inform this future? Uh, what I think is very important is um, that on this data sharing and those on how we work in the value chain, uh, more co-creation along the different elements of the value chain becomes important. So we need to be involved early on on all stages uh, with all the players in the industry to agree or not agree on is this something is worth pursuing in order to solve our our problem so transparency data sharing co-creation uh, partnerships ultimately that become more more important uh, and all this has to happen in a world which is drifting apart so we have some tough challenges ahead of us in order to maintain our path to a more sustainable and viable future uh, we have to overcome divisive politics that we see at works right now on a global scale and as uh, industry uh, we definitely want to take up uh, the fact that we are the second most polluting industry and i would like to say that in 20 20 years from now we are one of the cleanest ones so that would be a mission statement uh, where uh, we can rally all behind and then put our brains and energies to it textile is a great industry we give jobs to hundreds of millions of people uh, worldwide and uh, uh, we ought to uh, to make this uh, industry more sustainable it's at the end the most touched material that humans have worldwide if you think about it we are never except when we stand under the shower not in contact with our textiles so we should really care for them and make them better like my professor used to always say, as long as a child is born naked, you will always need textiles. Uh, so what's your point, uh, Mr. Faust? Well, um, I think uh, the, all the three stakeholders you mentioned, uh, the chemists, the machinery builders, and the technology providers, I think we, we need to add one more stakeholder in it. And that's that's the designer, uh, the product designer as well. So until unless, because of course, again, this whole sustainability matrix is so complex, maybe it's difficult for us, uh, even we connect all the, these three stakeholders, even it's difficult because we don't have the data or the complete life cycle ass assessment. So maybe we need uh, also one stakeholder that is the product designer who, who just need to evaluate that what we are designing, uh, what are the limitations, and of course, considering those limitations, uh, we need to design a product that has a minimum uh, environmental uh, footprint. Uh, I think this is this is important if we are just looking for for, for a circular future. Uh, other than this, of course, uh, until unless uh, we don't have uh, uh, connectivity of all these stakeholders in, in a single uh, platform, I think we, we, we cannot do anything. I think the uh, initi initiative of Europe of uh, regulating even the green claims nowadays, that's also a very important uh, thing that we need to discuss because maybe a lot many green claims, uh, they are just claims that they, they might be, they don't have a 
very uh, discrete data behind uh, that. So until unless we don't agree on a uniform structure of what we feel that it's circular and what we feel it's sustainable, uh, we may, maybe it's it's too confusing uh, that either what, whatever we are doing that's that's worth worth it or not. So maybe um, the transparency, uh, the inclusion of all the stakeholders, uh, that's that's very important when we are designing any product and we are declaring it a circular. So until unless we are not connecting, we cannot uh, just serve the whole global cause of sustainability. Well point said. So gentlemen, um, I enjoyed the entire discussion and your thought process and the viewpoints. These are the things which have came up to ensure that we, if we wanted to have a circle of future, which is the need of the hour and it is going to be the need, uh, these are the important uh, points which we need to consider and we need to work on that. Thank you very much. And I enjoyed every bit of your time uh, and thanks for all your knowledge sharing uh, and points perspectives which you have shared with us. Thank you very much. See you at ITMA 2023. 20,